Pot Stirrer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide. And it's not always polite. According to Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, the word authoritarian means one, of, relating to, or favoring blind submission to authority, two, of, relating to, or favoring a concentration of power in a leader or an elite not constitutionally responsible to the people. Amy Siskind, co-founder and president of The New Agenda, has kept a weekly list of news stories and other subtle changes that have occurred since Donald Trump's election. She started keeping this list of changes as authoritarianism experts note how quickly changes occur as a country slides into authoritarianism. Changes in values and norms to where if you don't keep track, the authoritarian reality becomes the new normal. Experts advise to write down the things changing around you so you'll remember, which is what Siskin started doing. As of this recording, she's on week 43, though week 44 should be out by the time this episode is released. I'll post a link to it on the website. There's been some signaling that Donald Trump is willing to work with Democrats. He worked out a deal with congressional Democrats on the debt ceiling, along with relief for Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. And he is said to be working with them on a deal reinstating DACA, with or without funding for the wall, depending on who you ask. But we should not let his lack of ideological loyalty distract us from the fact that this man is not fit to be president of the United States. And his regime's behavior, as I will discuss in a moment, is that of a dear leader, like his idols Vladimir Putin and Recep Tayyip Erdogan, instead of the leader of the free world. Every day Trump is president, we march toward authoritarianism and away from the democracy that generations of Americans have fought and died for. I am your host, Jay Poole. When I'm not podcasting, I have a number of hobbies, including watching sports and listening to sports commentary. So this incident merged my sports and political interests. Last Monday, September 11th, ESPN's Jamel Hill co-host of the ESPN show The Six, sent out three political tweets. Donald Trump is a white supremacist who has largely surrounded himself with other white supremacists. The height of white privilege is being able to ignore his white supremacy because it's of no threat to you. Well, it's a threat to me. Trump is the most ignorant, offensive president of my lifetime. His rise is a direct result of white supremacy, period. Many on the right compare her to former ESPN baseball analyst Kurt Schilling and state that Hill should be fired because Schilling was fired. They also state that by ESPN not firing her, they are showing their liberal bias. Both are convenient but incorrect arguments. ESPN has a policy against making public, non-sports-related political statements as a representative of their company. Kurt Schilling was warned multiple times before he was eventually fired. This is Jamel Hill's first offense under the policy. Secondly, ESPN has parted ways twice with noted liberal Keith Olbermann, and not only employees, but has promoted heavily Open conservative Will Kane. And what about her statements? She's sure not wrong. Just this past Thursday, after Congress passed a bipartisan resolution condemning white supremacy and calling on the White House to condemn it unequivocally, Trump continued to provide comfort to white supremacists, Nazis, and domestic terrorists with his most recent both sides comment regarding the Charlottesville terror attack. He has also retweeted false statistics posted by white nationalists overstating the percentage of murders of whites by blacks, and then claimed ignorance when called out on it. 
He has a very long history of words and actions that support Hill's assertions, just some of which I ran through during episode 11. And unlike Hill, who apologized to ESPN, Trump has never apologized to anyone. The content of Hill's tweets should not be in dispute because the evidence is overwhelming. But something else arose from this that is quite a bit more concerning when we look at the big picture. Listen to Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders react to Jamal Hill's comments. Yes, uh, you mentioned um, a couple times today, you sort of emphasized diversity in the West Wing. Uh, and you talked about the president being very clear after Charlottesville and denouncing all hate. I just wanted to read a comment from an influential African-American sportscaster from ESPN yesterday who said, Donald Trump is a white supremacist who has largely surrounded himself with other white supremacists. His rise is a direct result of white supremacy, period. He's unqualified and fit to be president. Why do you think, do you have a reaction to that? Is the president aware of that comment? And I'm not sure if he's aware, but I think that's one of the more outrageous comments that anyone could make, uh, and certainly something that I think is a fireable offense by ESPN. If the president was so clear, as you said, why do you think influential uh, African-American figures are are saying things like I'm not going to speak for that individual, but I I know that the president has met, again, with people like Senator Scott, who are highly respected leaders in the African-American community. He's committed to working with them to bring the country together. I think that's where we need to be focused, not on outrageous statements like that one. In addition, Trump put out this tweet in response. ESPN is paying a really big price for its politics, and bad programming. People are dumping it in record numbers. Apologize for untruth. Trump lied regarding why ESPN is losing subscribers. The fact is that cable TV viewership as a whole is in decline because of millennial core cutting, not politics. But the most important issue is this. The fact that his administration has pushed for a private entity to punish their employee for public dissent is undemocratic and dangerous. This is why the Democratic Coalition, a super PAC, has filed an ethics complaint against Huckabee Sanders, stating that she crossed the line when she called for Hill to be fired from ESPN. According to 18 U.S. Code Section 227, it is a federal crime punishable by a fine or up to 15 years in prison or both for any executive branch employee to influence or threaten to influence a private employment decision. What ESPN chooses to do with Jamal Hill should be between the company and her, just like any other private employer and employee. They have regulations in place, and by working for the company, the employee chooses to abide by them. I do believe there should be some ethical boundaries to at-will employment agreements, but that tangent is really for another show. But here's the point. ESPN's actions regarding Jamal Hill are a private employment matter. But the First Amendment protects people from government interference in speech. If the government is demanding a private company make an employee apologize for dissent or fire an employee for dissent, that is abridgment of that person's First Amendment rights. That is the part that should not be tolerated by the American people, whether we agree with Jamal Hill or not. Potstirer Podcast will be back after this. Did you know for today's episode, there's been a lot made about the need for the Democrats to pick up congressional seats in 2018. And in the wake of the high-profile defeat of Democrat John Ossoff by Republican Karen Handel in a special election earlier this year for Georgia's 6th District, Republican and Democratic pundits alike were declaring the Democratic Party as a party in ruin and almost dead, hopeless against a Republican Party in control of most state legislatures, governorships, both chambers of Congress, and the presidency. The idea that the Democrats could beat Republicans, even in districts very closely divided, seemed like a pipe dream. After all, gerrymandering and voter suppression mean that Republicans could do whatever they want, and their seats are safe, right? But did you know that just last Tuesday, 
Democrats won two special state legislative elections in heavily pro-Trump districts in New Hampshire and Oklahoma. In New Hampshire, Democrat Charles St. Clair beat Republican Steve Wally in a special election for a state legislative seat by 12 percentage points. This district saw Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton by 17%, and Republican registration is 12% higher than Democratic registration in the district. In Oklahoma, Democrat Jacob Rosecrans beat his GOP opponent, Darren Chambers, by 20 points for an open state legislative seat. Trump carried this district by 11 points. Both districts were previously represented by Republicans. Overall, six state legislative seats in 2017 have flipped from Republican to Democratic control, while no Republican so far has won a seat previously held by a Democrat. While these are very small victories for the Democratic Party, they are important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, elections and representation are determined primarily at the state level. The primary reason why the GOP has outsized representation on all levels of government compared to their actual support among the electorate can be traced back to gerrymandering and voter suppression, executed by Republican state legislatures. To combat gerrymandering and voter suppression, the issue needs to be corrected at the state level. The Democrats can't rely on the U.S. Supreme Court to do this, as the court has become more conservative with the appointment of Neil Gorsuch and is likely to lean more to the right as long as a Republican holds the presidency. The GOP picked up about 900 state legislative seats during Obama's presidency, so the Democrats have a long way to go, but you gotta start somewhere. Secondly, the Democratic Party has been somewhat timid in terms of which Democratic candidates they are willing to support. They seem to be leaning towards the ones that are running in districts that are close, that at most went for Trump by very small percentages. These special elections, while again very small, also indicate that support for Trump and the GOP may be softening, and the Democrats could have an opening if they are willing to take the risk and take advantage of it. But Dems, no risk, no reward. Take a chance, guys. Now, back to Potstirer Podcast. Authoritarian governments are characterized by strong central power and limited political freedoms. According to late political scientist and sociologist Juan José Lintz, authoritarian regimes can be characterized by four qualities. I'll briefly mention all of them and how these may manifest in the Trump regime. 1. Limited political pluralism Authoritarian regimes will generally rely on a small set of key groups and prevent the expression of certain group interests. This is why authoritarian regimes tend to oppress political minorities while taking on the mantle of other specific groups. Trump is known to throw red meat to his base, whether it's his both sides comments, the removal of transgender people from the military, or most famously, promoting the wall. While slightly fewer than 50% of voters voted for Trump, his most die-hard supporters tend to be white evangelicals, white supremacists, and working-class whites, especially though not exclusively white men from the Midwest and South. 2. Legitimacy based on emotion Linz discusses this as a regime generally stating they exist as a necessary evil to combat easily recognizable societal problems such as underdevelopment or insurgency. When Trump spoke at the Republican National Convention, where he was crowned the GOP nominee, he spoke about rampant crime, which was a lie since crime has gone down. He said we needed law and order, and that, quote, I alone can fix it, unquote. 
increased support of the militarized and unaccountable police state, which Trump is supporting with the pardon of Joe Arpaio, seems to be where we're going under Attorney General Jeff Sessions. The mentality to support this, the idea that police only kill because they feel threatened, and fear is sufficient to justify the killing of unarmed and legally armed citizens, has already taken a foothold in much of American society. 3. Minimal social mobilization, usually caused by constraints such as suppression of both political opponents and anti-regime activity. We're seeing a great deal of mobilization right now, but the regime is fighting to stop this on various levels. The Jamal Hill controversy is one example, but if we go even further back, Trump spoke about locking up his election opponent, Hillary Clinton. Jailing political opponents tends to be something spoken of or done by authoritarian leaders like Erdogan or Putin, not leaders in functioning democracies. The legislation being pushed through in a number of states that would make it legal to run over nonviolent protesters blocking thoroughfares is another way in which government is attempting to strangle social mobilization by anti-regime forces. 4. Informally defined executive power, often with vague and shifting powers. This has been a long time coming in the United States as more and more powers have been given to the executive, which was not the intent of America's founders. So this is not new to Trump. But the executive under Trump has been a revolving door with many positions continuing to go unfilled and appointed positions, especially at the top of the cabinet level departments, being held by people with little to no experience and some who are outright hostile to the departments they lead Examples would be Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, who's a critic of public schools and teacher unions and supporter of charters and private schools, and head of the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, Scott Pruitt, who is a climate change denier who sued the EPA. Another feature of note in this administration is that positions at the top are increasingly being filled by generals, which is a bit concerning. The Trump regime can be said to hit each feature on Lentz's checklist, and we should really take note of that. If we look at other ways authoritarianism is recognized, it should wake us up. Maria J. Stefan and Timothy Snyder wrote a great piece in The Guardian regarding authoritarianism globally, including how to recognize it and what to do about it. They state, quote, Modern authoritarians rely on repression, intimidation, corruption, and co-optation to consolidate their power. The dictator's handbook, mastered by Orban in Hungary, Erdogan in Turkey, Maduro in Venezuela, Zuma in South Africa, Duterte in the Philippines, and Trump here, provides the traditional tactics. Attack journalists, blame dissent on foreigners and paid protesters scapegoat minorities and vulnerable groups, weaken checks on power, reward loyalists, use paramilitaries, and generally try to reduce politics to a question of friends and enemies, us and them, unquote. The authors make the argument that authoritarianism can be resisted and defeated, and the best way to do this is by nonviolent resistance. Quote, Unarmed civilians using petitions, boycotts, strikes, and other nonviolent methods have been able to slow, disrupt, and even halt authoritarianism. Civil resistance has been twice as effective as armed struggle. Civil resistance works by separating the authoritarian ruler from pillars of support, including economic elites, security forces, and government workers. It attracts diverse groups in society whose collective defiance and stubbornness eventually elicits power shifts. Mass, diverse participation empowers reformers and whistleblowers and weakens the support base of hardliners. The best gauge of the health of a resistance movement, then, is whether the size and representativeness of active participation are growing. Unquote. So how do we get the resistance to grow and sustain itself? What I would say is that we need to stop being afraid of the truth. Like Jamal Hill, 
we need to be willing to tell the truth. The election already happened, and Americans made choices based on what was or wasn't important to them. Did the rise of white supremacy, white nationalism, and Nazism play a role? Sure. Let's not tiptoe around it to save people's feelings. Of course, not everyone factored these issues in as to why they voted for Trump. Not every Trump supporter is a white nationalist. At the same time, it can be argued that people knew or should have known what they were getting into when they voted for Donald Trump. His words and deeds are a matter of public record. But life is full of choices. That may have been your choice in November 2016, but it does not have to be your choice now. We not only have the benefit of the historical record, we have the benefit of knowing how Trump actually behaves as president. The truth shall set you free, but the choice is yours. Own the choices you make. We need to continue to mobilize, nonviolently resist, and support each other in the resistance because our way of life depends on it. Because we are not only on a march toward authoritarianism, we may already be there. Check out our website today, potswearpodcast.com, for previous episodes, special presentations, announcements, merch, and all things Potstirer Podcast. You can find our show on iTunes, Google Play, and most other podcatchers. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us five stars, leave a review, share, and tell your friends. Thank you for listening and supporting Potstirer Podcast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free.